now that we know how to recognize a discrete random variable, how to make a distribution of it in both a table and a graph form, we want to be able to find the mean and the standard deviation of that discrete random variable uh, for some very good reasons, especially in regards to the mean. So when you look at the formula for the mean, it looks kind of complicated, but it actually isn't so bad. The mean is a mu value, and we'll talk about why that is in just a second, but it's the mean of the x's, and it's equal to the sum right, because that sigma means you add, of each variable value times its probability. That's it. That's all you do. So you, you multiply the value times the probability, value times the probability, and then you just add them all up. Now why is that a mu? We haven't seen mu used a lot in this course. We've seen a lot of x bar, but this is actually mu. And the reason for that is it's, it's kind of a hypothetical argument. So the mean mu of a discrete random variable x represents the mean result when the experiment is repeated an indefinitely large number of times. In other words, forever, infinitely time, infinite number of times. This is the whole population because you're thinking about this distribution for all possible future repetitions of this. In other words, the mean is considered to be the mean of the population of all possible future repetitions of the experiment. So anytime you might ever do this, this mean will work out, right, as the center. So it's kind of a hypothetical argument. When you're creating a probability distribution, what you're doing is accommodating for the entire population because the entire population has to fall in that distribution. Otherwise, it's not truly a probability distribution. Distribution, excuse me. That's why, for example, it sums to one at the end because you have every possibility accounted for. There are no other possibilities. So even if you did this experiment infinitely many times, these five results are all you'd ever get with these probabilities associated with them. All right, now the other issue is the mean is also called the expected value of the random variable. And I cannot stress how important that is. That is very important. Um, as we perform more and more experiments, if you did this infinitely many times, the mean of the results of those experiments gets closer and closer to that expected value of the random variable. In other words, the mean, the center, the balance point, is what you expect to happen for that probability experiment. doesn't mean it's what's going to happen. It's what's expected in the long run, of course. All right, so we find them, however, when you use your calculator, the same way you would um, find a weighted mean from chapter three. So let me just show you the NBA finals real quickly. Um, this will be pretty straightforward. So if you wanted to do this with a calculator by hand, all you have to do is multiply each number of games times its probability, and then you add them. So you go four times 0.123 plus five times 0.246 plus six times 0.354 plus seven times 0.277. Right, that's how to do it by hand. You get 5.785. Now keep in mind we've lost a little bit of accuracy by doing it this way because all of our probabilities were rounded. All right, now what if we want to do it with the calculator and have the calculator do the work for us. So I'm going to go up and press clear on L1 and L2. I'm going to type 4, 5, 6, 7 for L1. And then for L2, I'm going to be crafty about this. Now I could type 0.123, sure, but I'm actually going to do 8 divided by 65. Enter. And look, it keeps all the decimal places for me that way. And then I can do 16 divide 65, enter. 23 divided by 65, enter. 18 divided by 65, enter. Then I run to stat, calculate, one variable. L1 is my list, and L2, second 2, will be my frequency list. I'll go down to calculate and press enter. And there's the mean right there, 5.785 when you round it. All right, so let me go put that in. And it pays to write down the by hand calculation as well, um, not just the results, because that by hand calculation is actually so simple that we use it a lot. It's in a way easier than going in into stat edit all the time and typing 
all the numbers and probabilities and stuff. I mean, that's a little bit more accurate that way sometimes, um, but it's not always that helpful. So make sure you know how to do both ways. Now for the standard deviation, however, we're definitely using the calculator. We are not doing this by hand. So when I look at the calculator, the calculator gave me a value. Let me bring it back up. Stat, calculate, one variable. L1, L2, that's fine. And interestingly enough, it doesn't actually even give it us an S. Now why is that? Well, that's because the denominator would be zero. Let me show you why. Remember that the probability sum, let me go back here, probability sum up to one, right? Now, if I open the notes for chapter three, if you look at the sample standard deviation formula right here on the right, you'll notice something interesting. That denominator is n minus one, but you just said, or we just said, you didn't say it, that the sum was that was one, and one take away one is zero, and division by zero is bad, 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 and your calculator can't do it, right? And therefore, that's why the calculator doesn't even give you an S, because your N, look right here, N is one. Your sum of your right-hand column, your probability column is one, and it better be, right? Otherwise, it's not really a probability distribution. So interestingly enough, the standard deviation is a sigma, which makes sense because the mean was a mu. So let me put that notation in there. So the sigma, and it's sigma sub x, just like it's mu sub x, but it's Greek, so it's sigma. And it was, let's think, 0.984 or so, approximately. Heck, I'll even go one more, 9844. All right, so now we want to interpret the mean and standard deviation in the context of the situation. I take it back, I should just do one. I'm gonna match the decimal places here. So if you were to randomly select, if you were to randomly select an NBA final series, you would expect it to last 5.785 games, give or take 0.984 games. There we have it. Now keep in mind your experiment here is actually to draw one of these final series. So you, of course they've happened in the past, but your random selection of one of them has not happened in the past. So you take the list of all the final series from 1950 to 2014, you put them all in a hat and you're going to randomly select them. So you expect it to last, whichever one you draw out of the hat, 5.785 games, give or take 0.984 games. Now we could extrapolate from here and say, well, we think this might be similar to what it would be going forward. However, um, our distribution is really talking about a probability distribution for selecting from that data that we have. Um, because the NBA final series are kind of more subjective probabilities, their probabilities are changing constantly. Um, that can make things a little bit wonky for us trying to extrapolate, you know, how long the series is going to be in 2020 or something like that. Now this mean that we found here, 5.75, has a whole other meaning, this expected value meaning that we need to expand upon further. And we'll do that in the next video.